for the alums and for now more recently in faculty also. Um, so I want to thank you guys all for coming and for supporting uh, this event. We've got a great speaker tonight. But I want to bring up our assistant, our assistant director, Sam, because she's the one who put all this together and put all this hard work. And she'll give you a little bit more info on what we're going to hear tonight. So welcome. outside the um, space so if you walk up make a left it's going to be on your right hand side so in case you use the restroom don't be afraid that you can't get to it um, free food drinks enjoy I'm going to kick it off telling a little bit about Travis but I'm more than sure he's going to go into a deeper dive but this talk specifically is going to be talking about rehumanizing digital communication building empathy empathy back online um, so quick little story about Travis for me him uh, when I first started the launch pad seven years ago Travis was in the idea stage of working on his first venture and I had the pleasure to kind of see him grow and it's something that I will never forget because he was such a great advocate um, for the launch pad and spoke very highly of us so we're very appreciative and very excited to have him back here um, on UM grounds and we hope to hear many many more great things that he's working on and stay in touch as much as we can um, so he is a 2014 graduate and he's I've been on the Entrepreneur's Magazine 2018 Most Daring Entrepreneur, Forbes 30 Under 40, Speaker at Cannes Lions, CES, Social Media Week, Advertising Week, South by Southwest, and Harvard Business School. He's featured in the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Forbes, Tech Crunch, and the New Yorker. So with that being said, let's welcome some Travis on. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's always a really awesome opportunity to come back to the campus. It's, it gets more beautiful every single time. New York does not look like this, trust me. Um, but it's really good. Thank you for having me, Launchpad. Um, I'm always excited to come speak to the students and fellow entrepreneurs. Um, so I want to take a couple minutes to talk about building empathy back online, but I'm also going to spend some time just talking about entrepreneurship as well. We'll, we'll open it up for Q&A. Um, but let's start with this, what happens when it just works. So let's start with this icon. Everyone knows it. And when you see it, it's like inspiring dread or validation all at the same time, depending on the context, right? It's crazy how a little symbol that did not exist a decade ago has so much meaning. And it's because messaging is the most frequent signal activity on the planet. Right now, there are over 193,000 text messages sent each second. On Holler alone, there's over a billion messages sent each day. To put that into context for you, in 1995, there was on average a, a there was on average a half a message sent each month. That's six messages per year. Today, there are 10 trillion messages sent monthly. Think about that. And when you go, when you go even further, you think about with all of these, the, all of the messages sent each year across all of these environments, Messaging has created this brilliant opportunity for us to misunderstand each other. There is $37 billion lost each year due to digital miscommunication. If you think about that, that is more than the GDP of Libya or Jordan or two thirds of the countries on this planet for that matter. And that's just businesses. Think about how much is lost with consumers. And that's just financial. How could you begin to quantify the emotional damage done? There's a reason why this exists. Misunderstandings, which is essentially a misunderstanding, but with text messages. But beyond the humor, there is something deeper than misunderstanding that's lost. <laughs> 
for all of our efficiency and connectedness, communication is actually suffering. Let's take this for a second. One in three teens report having, back in the day, one in three teens reported being bullied in their lifetime. Now, more than one in three teens report having experienced online bullying in the last month. What's sad is, is that online bullying has become the new norm. It is the, it is a characteristic that is defining an entire generation. It is the exception to not have experienced it. It's that the more that we communicate online, the less meaningful our words seem to become. It's that the more that we communicate with each other in words, the more damage that it creates. The more that we communicate anonymously without repercussions, and for, for those words to have the ability to be spread like wildfire, the more harm that people are doing to each other. So how can this be? How do we get to the point where we are, exper where we are experiencing uh, such damage and such damage in the communications that we have daily? It's because fundamentally the things that drive empathy in digital communications is inherently missing. So let's take this image, for example. There is Things that words, if you try to describe this image with words, a lot of meaning would inherently be lost. There have been studies that show that 7% of understanding is determined by words. 38% is based off of tone of voice, and 55% is based off of body language. 93% of understanding is nonverbal. So, Without visuals, you lose a hell of a lot of understanding, is the point. And let's take this as another example. I don't know. It's, you have, there's no way you know what this means. I could say this in literally 10 different ways. I could say, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You literally have no understanding of the underlying sentiment that these words have. It's impossible to understand it without any additional information. And so there's a reason why this, is a, this saying is a thing. A picture is worth a thousand words. And if a picture is worth a thousand words, is it also true that a, a word has a thousand times less meaning than an image. And that's just the first problem with online communication. The second problem with online communication is that the, we don't feel, we don't have accountability for the impact that our words have on the other end. We don't understand the, the pain, the shock, the joy, the surprise, the hurt. We have no idea what our words actually do to people. And this is causing a lot of different problems in these environments. These are the problems that drive online bullying and hate speech and all of these other things that plague a lot of the communication environments that we participate in today. It is so much so that the inventor of the internet said this. He said that humanity connected by technology on the web is functioning in a dystopian way. We have online abuse, prejudice, bias, polarization, fake news. There are a lot of ways in which the internet is broken. And continuing to go even further, we don't even own our words. Right? Our words can be, our words are able to be taken by large tech companies, analyzed, and manipulated in any different way that they please. 
And so in an environment where our words have the opportunity to be not well understood, in an environment where our words, we don't understand where our words, we don't understand the impact that our words have for the users on the other end, and in an environment where the words are not even ours, it leaves a lot of opportunity for uh, a lot of things to go wrong. Uh, NYU professor talks about this they call, talks about it as surveillance capitalism, which is technology companies collecting and analyzing data for the purpose of understanding intent and, and capitalizing on it for commercial purposes. It is a practice that has become standard in the, in the organizations of many large tech companies, and it's the reason why we've seen a lot of the communication environments that we've engaged in be subject to the issues that they have today. And so we go back to this concept that we don't own our words. They have less meaning, yet, cause, yet they're causing more damage than ever. So you go back to how do we fix that? We fix that by, we're in an environment where AI helps make meaning of our words. But we can take ownership of AI to build a more effective solution to deliver uh, better communication and safer spaces for people. How do we build back what we've lost? We've combined AI to understand the intent that consumers have and use that to deliver things that drive empathy in conversations. But in order to do that, we first need to understand what empathy is. So empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. Empathy is something that is core to humanity. It's what makes us human. It's a feature that is reserved by our species and it was learned over an incredibly long period of time. And empathy is driven by visuals. What we've seen is that even children, at the earliest stages of their childhood, they learn they learn how to identify emotions based off of visual cues off adults. That's your, empathy, since the earliest days, have always been inherently visual. Empathy has always been visual. Um, it, is why, it is why when we watch a movie and we see something tragic happen to someone else, we, we cry. It is why we get happy when we see a loved one reunite with each other. Visuals, which is 93% of meaning, is what drives empathy for human beings. It is a feature that is, exists in the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is a feature that has only existed in human species. And so literally, empathy is our human superpower. So when you go back to understanding what makes us human, if we go back and understand that communication is what brings us together as people, 93% of what we understand is what the meaning that we obtain is nonverbal. And we know that visuals help bring empathy back into conversations, then we could say that visuals could be used as a solution to help bring empathy back online in digital environments. And that's exactly where Holler comes in. And so at Holler, each day, we serve billions of messages uh, to consumers all around the world for the purpose of adding visual content back to their conversations whether it's excitement, joy, sadness, surprise, we do that for consumers for the purpose is of enriching their conversations everywhere. And we recently done a, we recently completed a study to understand how do people engage, how do people express emotions all around the world depending on who they are. We did studies of people ranging from in India, Japan, and Korea, the US, Brazil, China. 
And what we found is that people universally agree that visuals help improve their conversations regardless of how they use them. Adding visuals to your conversations is a global behavior. It helps us express things that words couldn't do alone. And when we dug deeper to understand why people use visuals to add visuals to their conversations, it really buckets down into three different things. One, expression. So being able to express emotions that words couldn't possibly express on their own. Two, to drive someone to take action. Think about how many times somebody sends an email and says, hey, could, hey checking in, when do you think you're going to get this done? Smiley face. <laughs> and lastly, to diffuse a situation. So if their conversation is going wrong, you add a visual to be able to kind of end the conversation and move on. And at Holler, we believe that not only should we provide you the visuals that help you express yourself and drive empathy, but we also deliver you these, we, our technology is implemented into your conversation environments in a way that is safe. We never, we, we, our, our AI lives on your phone, it never collects personalized and sensitive personal information about you, and we feel like there's no need to do that to deliver you a great experience. We fundamentally believe it is time for a new, it, it is time for a new generation of tech. The next generation tech company that ha puts the consumer first, that doesn't need to collect your private information in order to deliver your, you a service. A company that doesn't have to sacrifice and sell you, s sell your, your human experience for the purposes of, for the purpose that you didn't sign up or subscribe to. We've proven that it could be done. We do, we do it for millions of people around the world. And so what we believe is that we could create a narrative that inspires the next generations of tech companies to do the same. When you are the standard, you can set the standard. So for us, that means evaluating the means by which we acquire data, how we use data, and ensuring that when we do use data, we make a positive impact. You couldn't imagine how many times I've heard that we should be taking user data and selling it for whatever reason that they describe. And as a, my first reaction is, that's not really a novel idea. It's an idea that could, really, it could easily be done, but the question is, what should we do and what should we not do? And so we, when we go back and boil it into all of these things, the idea is how can you, as, a, as an entrepreneur, how could you be disruptive without being destructive? How can you develop solutions for people that are predicated on helping people versus solutions that only drive profit? There's been a changing sentiment with respect to how consumers choose how to spend their money and choose the services that they want to use. And if your services don't have the correct ethos, then they won't drive the type of performance that you want to. And so whether you're selling goods, whether you're selling a service where you're delivering technology, you need to bake it back into, you need to step back and bake it into a more moral layer that you know that will drive the the spirit of your company and everything else and all the decisions that you make. Facebook had their own spirit, and I believe in the spirits of different companies. Facebook's spirit was move fast and break things. Right? You could see that they moved fast and they broke a lot of things. Right? And for us, our spirit is always to break. And that's harder than it sounds. Right? So we always have to do right. Anytime we do anything, with your within conversation environments, we make sure that we ask ourselves the moral question, is this the right thing to do? And that's how we drive our business. And we're up for that challenge. It's the harder, it, it, at times it could be viewed as the harder way to do things, 
But what we found is that one of the biggest drivers of growth today, the reason why we add tens of millions of users every single month, is because of the fact that we have we built the trust of some of the largest companies in the world and the consumers that use those services to enable us to be a part of their intimate experiences. So that's kind of it for me uh, with respect to that kind of, that topic, and then we can open it up for yeah. the conversation. Cool. Thank you, Charlie. Yeah. Environments that I didn't know. 
I moved around, I traveled around, I surrounded myself with people who had very different discipline for me. I knew nothing about advertising and I remember doing sales pitches for advertising products and I didn't know what I was talking about at the time. Um, but I learned really quickly as I was doing it. Um, but I think, to go back to your original question, I think the, the difference between being a college entrepreneur and an entrepreneur um, outside is just the learning process. Traditionally, when you're a college entrepreneur, you have not had all of the experiences yet. Um, and so I, I, what I would encourage any co entrepreneur in college still is to take advantage of as many experiences as possible and as many learnings. Because there is there in many situations, and I know a lot of founders that have experienced this, your first idea might not be the idea, the, 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 the idea. You might, the first idea might lead you to your idea, or it might act, or through the experience or journey, you'll meet people that you might want to do something together. And so it's all about the experience and taking advantage of uh, all of the resources around you, and whether it's people or programs or anything, in order to start taking that, the meaningful steps and starting your journey. How do you continue to challenge yourself? Um, so, Every single, every, so I spend, I try to run at the, the toughest challenges in our business at all times. And so um, usually whether it's, whether it's in sales or under, trying to understand our AI research or creative process or anything like that, um, you have, I had to build those practices in our business and I didn't start with them. And so usually I find myself in a constant place of discomfort because I'm doing things, I'm, I'm constantly engaging in arenas that are not, that, are, that seem foreign to me. So I started working in restaurants and I studied finance. I graduated with a degree in finance here at the University of Miami. I knew nothing about tech, but I wanted to start a tech company. And so I had to learn the general practices of tech um, and how, how to develop tech solutions. Our businesses and our business ended up being oriented in the advertising kind of marketing community. I knew nothing about that. More than like marketing <laughs> <laughs> um, So understanding advertising media and, and that entire environment was something that I had to, to learn and be able to be well versed in in order to have to engage with senior industry executives or leaders to, to convince them to, to change. Um, the requirements of the business over time changes. We need a creative studio. We need an AI research team. We need all these different things, and these things are not germane. So I think it's, it's it, by way of executing that has been my challenge. Um, but it's something I enjoy. And now, when I walk down the halls, you know, it, it's really exciting to see that they, we, there's a wide variety of people uh, at the company and people that I you know kind of get a little sense or more, I have a stronger sense of what their day to day is and um, the life of them. What's your favorite productivity tool? My favorite productivity tool? Um, I think, so to be honest, I do most. So fun fact, um, and this drives my team nuts probably, but uh, I do most of my business through text messaging. So I do, I message, whether it's Slack, I communicate mostly through Slack, I communicate with all, like, as soon as I make a new business contact, I try to move them to text messages really quickly. So I ask for their phone numbers and things like that. The reason why I do that is because it proves my point, messaging is, the way to get the fastest response from executives. So when you're selling with people, I get far more response and engagement in text messaging than if I shoot emails in their inbox. So I'm living, like I, in my day to day, like I believe messaging is the one of the most powerful channels to reach people. I believe that it is going to be the future of how people interact with each other. And so in the day to day, I use primarily messaging platforms to deliver the messages that, to, to execute and function. Okay. And what about startup book? What's your favorite read, business book? <clears throat> um, my favorite. 
Um, you know, I've read it a couple times, and I think it's still the case. It's the hard thing about hard things. Okay. It has to be. Um, because of, it, it's one of those things that really resonates with me as an entrepreneur, because it's the stuff that people don't tell you, right? It's the, like every entrepreneur likes to think about entrepreneurship, every, every first time we're early entrepreneur likes to think about entrepreneurship as like Entrepreneur Magazine, Forbes, and Fast Company, and TechCrunch, and it's gonna blow up, and it, they, they, don't, they don't really telegraph the stories of when you're staying up all night, or when that thing crashed, or like when there was like a haywire disaster and you had to overcome it. Like one of the things that they were telling us as an entrepreneur when you're starting is that you can have your best day and your worst day the same day, right? So it's like really interesting, it's a really interesting experience. I have so much respect for any founder because it takes grit. It takes grit. So when you think, when you're thinking about, as you're starting and working on all your different companies, Understand that, like what you're, what you might be going through at any given moment is not, is it, it, it is, it's part of the journey, and you'll see as you go along that it gets a little easier. You will get more people around you. It's actually easier to run, like at a certain point, it gets easier to run the company than the early days because a lot of stuff just starts happening, and that's like a weird time when you get in the company where like people are just doing stuff. And they're like, oh wow, that's crazy. Um, but yeah, I think, I think. Okay, um, and my last question. So mentors, you have any mentors, advisors, people you look up to when running a company? Tons, okay. tons. So I make it like, I'm like probably like a, a mentorship hug. <laughs> like, so I try to make it my job to create the, the most diversified, um, an engaged group of advisors that I can. I have advisors that can advise me pretty much on every single subject matter from uh, data security to uh, entering mainland China to marketing to like fundraising and finance. And I engage with those mentors on a regular basis. It's important that when you get, you, uh, you bring on advisors or mentors, that you don't treat it as a like kind of one-off kind of relationship. Because you're not like you're not encouraging a behavior where they're going to be invested in your business. If you're creating a mentorship or advisory, it's a it's a more meaningful engaged relationship. And that way you get not only you get more out of it, but they do as well. Right? And so what I found is that a lot like you know now that I'm a more mature entrepreneur, a lot of the advisors and mentors they become great friends. They're people I speak to often. They're like really awesome, and they they continue to they continue to create new opportunities, make great introductions, and it it it's, it it's, it turns around to a point where I don't have to ask for introductions. They're constantly thinking about me as an individual, and. I just constantly, they, they understand my objectives, they understand the things that are important to me, and they, in their daily lives, when they're coming across people that make sense for my business, they make those introductions. And so, don't just take having mentors and advisors as a side hustle, right? Like, you wanna make sure that it's part of the, the journey of being a founder or an entrepreneur, because those are the things that really help build you. When I moved to New York, I knew no one. And I had to start from scratch. And I had one, I had one person um, who really invested in me in New York and started introducing me uh, to a lot of different people. And today, like, we still have a really great relationship. Um, and we, like, we still talk every, almost every single day. And he's continued to add value and make introductions. Awesome. Well, with that, we'll open it up to anyone who has any questions. I met your story, and I found it very fascinating, and I came to school here as well for uh, part of my MBA. And I have to be honest, I've been for 25 years in media, and with all due respect, I've never heard about the company. A, how do you go about creating branding, and are you more of a B2B or B2C operation? Mm -hmm. Uh, so right now we're a B two B to C operations, and so for the first part of the first part of our journey, we've been focusing on developing audience. 
right? And so we first developed a service that was developed, distributed to some of the largest global platforms in the world. So if you lose an application like Venmo, we just onboarded 52 million users in Venmo on the last 45 days. And so we, we, we first focused on doing things like that, and we continue to ramp our audiences in global markets in, in that way. Um, in the last about six months, what we've started to do is allow marketers onto the platform. And so some of the things that we've done is we've been advising companies like Ikea and Subway and Chipotle and MTV and what have, Diageo, what have you, about how to develop a messaging agenda. Over the last 12 months, you might have realized that Mark Zuckerberg talked about how the future of social is private messaging. And that, and that we're seeing that. Last year, there were 100 trillion messages sent to the messaging environment versus 1.8 trillion searches on Google. Right? So the order of magnitude with respect to how much more engagement is moving into messaging environments versus places like social or search has caused the, has driven the attention um, from the large platforms. So going forward, what we're focused on is making sure that we work with some of the global brands, cross category from CPG, QSR, entertainment, et cetera, to ensure that they're able to enter into these messaging environments for which Holler exclusively controls. Uh, you, mentioned, sorry, you mentioned AI, and yet you seem to be a little bit, um, which I found fascinating and, and very, uh, but you seem to be a little concerned with um, gathering data. You, you don't ultimately gather data on your users in order to do content recommendation? Yeah, so you don't, so the way that we, we believe that in conversation environments, a practice that involves sending people's private messages to a server and understanding and, and maintaining historical personalized information about a user's conversation is morally incorrect. And so for us as a company, we make sure so we make sure that there is no there's first of all the net your the content your physical messages are never sent to our servers. And we've developed software that could live in the applications that we power and we train we tra we train models that are dynamically improved and delivered down to those devices. That that methodology is how that has enabled us to form partnerships with even financial companies like PayPal or companies that operate in mainland China that need to that we need to operate with inside of the context of the Chinese firewall as well. Um, and so it's 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 a philosophy around how you develop software that's fundamentally different. And it's it 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 involves disentangling identity from context and, and making sure that you're not ever um, in a position where you're collecting personal PI or personal information from people. Yeah, I, I'm an investor in Holler, and I'm, I'm embarrassed that I don't know the answer to this question. But um, you said you're B2B to C. So have you thought about creating a, um, is, is, is it, can you access Holler's environment directly, or do you have to go through other apps, number one? So I have two questions. So, do you, have you thought about creating your, your yeah. a direct consumer? So we do have a we do have our direct consumer property. Yeah, so, how, how do you access? Yeah, so you could download Holler and iMessage, um, and you could access our content there. We have a uh, so we leverage a B to B to C approach to distribute product, but we don't white label products. So if you look into any applications that we're integrated in, it is powered. It says powered by Holler. Um, the way that we view Holler's position in, um, in these spaces is what's called an ingredient brand. So a brand like Visa. Visa is a brand that lives in context of other brands, right? But Visa means safety, reliability, security, right? And so you're in a position where you could, even if you were in a Tiki Hut in Fiji and it said Visa, you knew that that was a safe place to pay. And so for Holler, although we are a distributed platform, we focus on making sure that people understand that Holler is smart, Holler is safe, Holler is a place that is, is, is gonna give me good creative fun content, and building a reputation for the brand that will enable us to be the de facto system of record 
and what people expect when they have a communication experience. Okay. Um, thank you so much for being here today. I wanted to ask about building a tech company without necessarily, like you mentioned, you didn't have tech experience. So what was that like in terms of the app development stage and then going forward and building your company without necessarily that technical expertise behind you? So the first thing, so and, and whether it's technical expertise or any expertise, you find people who do. <laughs> um, so I think the first thing is, how do you, so when you, there's the things that you know you know, the things that you know you don't know, and the things that you don't know that you don't know. And so you want to have people who could spot the things that you don't know that you don't know. And then like if you, there's the things you know you don't know, you could get advisors and things like that to help fill in those gaps to help you do that. But there is power in collaboration. And so I, for me, the, that was one of my first maneuvers was figuring out how could I collaborate with people who have tech experience to help me build this. And they, like I'm a product guy, a technologist now, you know, years later, but it was through working with these people I've developed those knowledges, that knowledge over time. And so I would, my advice to you would be invest in uh, going to, like surrounding yourself with people that don't have the same type of skill sets as you if you're going to move, move more quickly. Um, so how do you see the future of the relationship between social media platforms and users? And do you think that current social platforms can make that shift? Or do you think it needs to be ingrained in the founding, like you were talking about tolerance, founded on that idea of not using data, but also really just doing right thing? Yeah, so I think there's going to be, are you talking, somebody asked, what, are you talking about the, the, the experience in social platforms? Yeah, I, I would say more of like the, I would say the, the relationship between the platform and like what the platform is actually doing for the user and, and facilitating those connections, those social connections. Yeah. So one of the things that you're going, there's two really big shifts um, with respect to social media that I got tra tra tracking closely. One is the move from social media to social entertainment. And so what we're seeing now is that there is a really big period, like, like that's the reason why TikTok is not Instagram, right? TikTok is social entertainment. Uh, Instagram is social media. Social media is described as more people, like, like characterizing their lives and tracking and taking pictures of what they're eating, doing, etc. The TikToks of the world, and now the bites and the tr and trillers and all those applications, are more oriented around people actually being full-on content creators. And that done at mass distributed scale. It's at a scale that we've never seen before. And I think that's a trend that's going to continue to, to increase over time. So that's one big trend about how the experience in social platforms are gonna change. The next generation has so much more creativity with respect to how to leverage these platforms because they're not technologically savvy, they're technologically innate, which is a completely different kind of, kind of paradigm. So there's that huge shift there. Um, secondly, there is a shift in, um, there's a shift to moving into private, more private spaces. So one of the things that you're going to see amongst the Facebook properties over the next couple of years is that those are going to be moved into groups and groups and communities and things like that. Um, and so this notion of open mass openness is going to get smaller over time. And that's gonna be done purposely by Facebook, but it's also a behavior that is being experienced, et cetera. And then in new platforms like this notion that you only follow your friends is not, like you don't just consume content from your friends anymore. You choose consume content from whoever you find is interesting. And so that's why there's like, you could see a person could become an influencer way more quickly on TikTok than they would on Instagram, right? Because you would require, on Instagram, you follow, your followers are usually your friends and your algorithm, like the way those algorithms work versus TikTok, if you did something innovative, it's off the races and then you could get a following there that's more based off, it's more interest-based versus network-based. 
So there's a lot of different interesting developments there with respect to how social media is behaving. And it's going to be interesting to see that over time, like how that continues to evolve. Yeah, so how is, you mentioned earlier about sustainable uh, advantage and uh, the competitive sustainable advantage. And you said that for, you know, budding entrepreneurs and startups, it's typically speed. Um, and you mentioned that uh, Hollers was kind of like the reputation that you guys have now, which it took some time to grow. But when you first started out, other than speed, what, what would you tell your investors in order to, what would you convey as your competitive advantage other than speed? Yeah. So, it's on, the, it's on the business by business basis. Like, one of the things is that, so like, I think we're, the thing that you need to describe is long, like what are your long-term loads and what are you gonna do to get there quickly, okay. right? So if, you're no, if your moats are network effect driven, right? So that, those are usually really, network effects are, and different types of network effects, whether it's data network effect, community network effect, or marketplace driven, or Whatever those are, network effects are going to be a strong load that you build over time. Um, exclusive contracts and relationships that are unbreakable, right? How are you going to get those? Like those are the types of things that create inertia in your business and become difficult to move. The things that I personally believe, so my personal belief is, like when people say I'm going to build the next AI, it's going to be better. I'm like, AI is going to be commoditized, right? So like it's going to be a commodity over time. Everybody's going to have it. And like, if, if you're at like a CES or something, everybody has the next AI, right? So it's more smart AI. So I'm like, that's not, a, that's not gonna be a moat. But what is, it, like what you could say though, is like not your capability to build AI is gonna be an advantage. But if you have proprietary data, right? So like you have data network effects, you have access to oil that fuels a machine that no one else is going to have access to, those are the types of things. So that's just an example. Yeah. But when you're thinking about it, it's like, if you, you're going to do these things today. And if we do these things, we're going to get these things. And we're going to do, and the reason why we're going to be able to do these things quickly is because we have speed, we're nimble, we're a good team, we have these active relations. Like these are the things that are going to allow us to do that, to get that. Right. And so being so you have like an overarching vision that you're, okay, these are eventually going to be our sustainable advantages. These are the, the steps that we're making in order to get that to happen. And that's what you tell, like, that's what gets people on board, I guess. Exactly. So thank you. That, that really helped to yeah. break down the steps. Bro. Hi. Uh, so let's go back for a minute when you talked about uh, TikTok um, really driving on, of, of uh, have, have being a platform for a specific type of content or media, what do you think of, do you think that, um, is your view, the view of the future means that niche platform uh, may be the platforms of the future? So, yeah. Piggyback on uh, what you said about Facebook moving more towards groups. Yeah. I think, so yeah, so I think what, it all starts with a, a fundamental, like, I think where you find, where the magic happens is if you could identify a shift in human behavior. So whether so what TikTok capitalized on that Facebook didn't realize for a long time, which is how TikTok is like almost a billion users now, is that they weren't just it wasn't just social media. They didn't cap, they didn't realize that people were becoming it was like social content, full blown content creation. And now that behavior is a behavior that's unique to TikTok and not a unique behavior to Instagram. Like the robustness of the storytelling on TikTok and the challenges and all those things are just completely unique to that. Um, and so I think that anytime we're able to identify those moments, it's, it's a really unique opportunity. Um, yeah, I don't, know if that, I don't know if that answers your question, but. No, no, yeah. I think it is. I mean, do you see that? being the trend of the social media platform of the future to identify different niches that yeah. I think we're gonna we're getting to the point where we're gonna have like the, the types of social media platform, the dust is settling, the, the types of platforms that we're using, I think what we're gonna find is opportunities within them. 
right? So there's other, there's a lot of big businesses that are being driven off the back of these platforms. A lot of the direct to consumer brands that you've seen developed over the last couple of years has been byproducts of these particular types of, these particular types of leveraging these platforms. And they're able to compete with the PMGs of the world because they're able to form distribution channels direct to consumer that they weren't, like none of the, you weren't able to do before these platforms existed. And so I think those are really powerful opportunities. Um, there's also going to be opportunities to, if you want to think about any type of change in how the, the, the interfaces, the human experiences, so when you're thinking about AR or those environments, how could you innovate and build the solutions that work in those contexts, especially if we think that they're still going to be driven by cameras for the point concern. Thank you so much again for coming. I'm Skyler, I'm an entrepreneurship major here. I know you. Yeah, exactly. Like we commented on one of my posts and stuff, yeah. and we thanks so thank you so much for that, uh, by the way. And so my question is, um, if or like what I would be interested in, if you could talk a little bit more about um, the kind of finance side of things in Mola and Hala, um, because I think you talked about speed um, that much, and also at that point being a really young student entrepreneur, um, I really love to learn more about that, how that worked, and how you found investors and how you secured funding at the end. Yeah. So. The, at the beginning, the first thing is, so with any early, early, early stage investment, like the investors that invest in that type of investment are people who are pretty much gamblers. So like, that's like, that's really the type of personality that you're dealing with because the reality is, is that you, a majority of, a, a large percentage of early stage companies fail. Right, and so the person who you are, who you're raising money from, isn't going to be investing in a couple things. First and foremost, first and foremost, they're investing in you. Right, and so how, the way you present yourself, right, and the way as an entrepreneur, as a founder, that's going to be one of the most important data points in with respect to the consideration that that investor is going to do when they decide to write you a check or not. Does this person have the capacity to do what they say they're gonna do? Are they hungry enough? Are they inspired enough? And sometimes they're like, even if it's not this thing, I wanna see this person and I wanna start that relationship with that person because it might be their next thing and I might back that. And so first and foremost, you have to think about what is your, your brand as an entrepreneur and why do people, why would people want to back you? Why are you backable? Right, so that's the first thing. Have you shown capability in other disciplines that suggest that you have the, the capacity to do this? Do you have the mental toughness to do this? Like these are all the types of things that you want to make sure come across when you're talking to someone who is looking at the situation and the high, there's a high likelihood of failure, so I have to believe in you first. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, what, like, what is the big vision? What is the big idea that I'm, like you have to be able to articulate that really, really, really well. It has to be inspiring. If it's not inspiring, then like, I'm not going to, to get behind that. And so what you'll find is, first of all, you have a very, very inspiring vision and you are a compelling founder entrepreneur. Right? You don't underestimate how powerful, like how far along the way you are when you have those two things. Then the next thing is like, okay, then it's set down like how you're gonna do it, making sure you've done your homework, you're prepared, you've done your homework, you have the there, you, you built your collateral. Then there's all the stuff, right, your homework that you have to do. And when you have all those things, then you're in a better position to start this story. There's other things that you can do, like are you build, are you actively building a team of people to join you? Are you able to build a team of people to join you? Like when you're starting a company, you're selling to three people. You're selling to your customers, you're selling to, you're, pit, you're pitching customers, you're pitching investors, but you're pitching teammates, right? So not only if, if you, if, like winning customers is one proxy of success, but are you inspiring people to join you? That's another proxy of success. So you have to be able to, 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 to deliver, when somebody looks at you, an entire package of things that suggest that you might be the one to get out of the gate. 
right? And all those things together start making, make you a more viable uh, founder that I, like somebody might back. Thank you. That's all the time, unfortunately, that we have today. No. Thomas, thank you for coming back. It's very fun to have you. My question is regarding the current students that we see. Um, some of them are here tonight, I'm glad you guys are here. Um, the concern that I have with some of my current students is that they're very interesting and they don't know it yet and they have low confidence. So that's the first thing I'm hoping you can address finally is some confidence, tapping into their confidence. And the second thing is this networking part that they are concerned about breaking the ice and that there's a new game to offer after getting out there. Yeah. So with respect to, to, to to the confidence question, the confidence piece. The, um, one of the, like first, you should get comfort in understanding that no one knows the right answer, right? And like, you don't, you know, there's never, first of all, there's, there's not only one answer, right? And like many of the times, many of the time, you don't have the answer. And when you put yourself in that particular mindset, and you put yourself in a position of being okay that you're going to fail and actually expecting it, right? And it's not about like fail, like not getting timid because you think you're gonna fail. It's what are the learnings that you're going to do? I tell my team in particular, I rather them try 100 things and be right only 20% of the time than try 10 things and be right 90% of the time. Right? We've learned a whole hell of a lot that doesn't work and we still are better off anyway. Right? And so it has to, you start with this idea that you don't know everything and it's going to be okay. Right? And there's, you're not going to be good at everything and you shouldn't try to be as well. Like that's important. Like there's things that I'm great at, there's things that I'm not great at, and I have, but I, I partner with people who I know are. And one of the things that, even when we're building our teams internally, um, one of my advisors, he was uh, the head of people at Facebook and Google. And he was like, you know what, we didn't try to make people spending a lot of time working on things that they're bad at. We actually just want to make sure that people can optimize their time to focus on what they're good at. And so with respect to, like, you're, if you're going to be, if you're an entrepreneur, some, like, a lot of entrepreneurs think that they have to be the masters of everything in the universe. And that's not true. Right? I think more entrepreneurs have to be honest of what they're good at and the things that they're not, and then be, and, and be okay with that, and but actively work on surrounding yourself with people that are help, that will help you fill in those gaps. And so it's, it's, it's truly not, even till this, one, like even when we hire executives from major companies that are well off, the first thing that we do is make sure that there's no egos and we say that, we don't know, like, anything that we thought we knew, this is completely different, we don't know anything together, right? And we're going to work on this journey and figuring it out. But it, 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 if, if, if lack of confidence is coming from a place of feeling the need to be good at everything, and, or coming from a position where you, you are afraid to fail, don't worry about it. Don't worry about being good at everything. Don't worry about failing. It is a part of the journey, and it's a part of everything that'll happen. Um, okay. I would love to know about your experience when you're first off, like, first of your first MVP, when you had all those ideas narrowed down to the thing to make it more to penetrate your market. Um, so it's kind of like a big challenge right now, so it's so amazing to hear from someone who has been there. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I will tell you a funny story. So I remember when I like had my first idea, scribbled on a bunch of pieces of paper, and I ran into the launch pad uh, with it. And, uh, so they kind of looked at me and said, so you're trying to build the internet? And I was like, well, okay, I see your point. Uh, and so, you know, there's full excitement. You, 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 there's something there that's driving all of that. Um, and then it, it's like, okay, how do I start, like, Take it. What is it like to carve something? Whatever that tool is. Uh, chisel. Yeah. So you start chiseling it down to the to kind of what there's there's an idea in there. You got to chisel it down to what really really makes 
and what the work the meat is. Um, and so there was a there was a good chiseling process uh, as part of that. And then you know when we first launched, it was a lot of excitement. It got you know as we understood the realities of like how many recent, how much resources we have, that pushes what your MVP actually is going to be. Um, but we got it out, and we got it out the door, and you know we made sure we got it out quick. Like we didn't want to. There's so many features and stuff that we wanted to do, but it's more important to get something out quick. And if you're proud of your first release, then you waited too long. So you should just get out the door and see what happens. Um, we still do that to this day, right? Like you just gotta push out something out the door and see if it starts working. Um, but you have to be able to actively prototype and test things and push it out the door. Um, you learn a lot really quickly. Uh, I remember doing focus groups before I launched it, like before I put it out in the wild. And I brought 30 of my friends over and said, hey, what do you think? I cooked food for them, so that's quick way to do it. Yeah. So it's good. Yeah, and you just want to make sure you don't bias. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much. No worries. Kind of going off of that, um, I have a question. So thinking back on like your first iteration of our um, or just leading up to it, like what was your mindset to to keep going after it kind of plateaued and failed or you know, to keep pursuing entrepreneurship as a college? Yeah, so um, I think what so when we launched and we got like like a false kind of positive, uh, and then we saw it kind of meandering. What we did was we so this is like a defining moment of a founder, right? Are you going to fight or flight? Right? Are you going to be able to identify like objectively if something's working or not? And if it's not working, what are you going to do? Right? So you have to get to that critical kind of decision point in your mind about it. The thing, what you see a lot of times is that people decide, like they, they become too in love with the product in its current incarnation. And that is the, that is the enemy of success. Right? You cannot be too in love with your own original idea because you'll learn what it is. I thought it was news and video, it was smiley faces. So like, it, 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 you just never know what it's gonna be, right? Like, I, who would've known that people like the emojis better than the content I was showing? Like, put, and like the emojis took us one week to put in, right? Versus it's like the whole infrastructure of the app that we built. Um, and so you just never know, but it goes back to the concept of how are you going to make sure that you are, in your mind, you're like, I have a vision, and I'm going to, I don't know if this is the right way to manifest it, but we're going to iterate on our ideas quick, as quickly as possible and test to learn and see how people react to it before we run out of runway or the ability to do this at all, and so that we could get, uh, get to where we want to be. Um, there's also another paradigm where, like, we have, I kind of create a, like, kind of a pyramid for our team. And I have our vision up here, right? And then I say our vision is per, per, our, our, our vision is supported by these kind of high themes. And then these themes are supported by these objectives and goals, right? And then there's all the things at the lowest level, right? There's always going to be thrash around at the lower levels of that. But so goals, objectives, all those things change. You move those things around. They change over time. If they start getting too high and you're, you're, you think the themes are thematically changing, then you, that should be alarmed. And then it gets to the point where you have to start question, is this, the right, is this the right vision or mission? If you see thrash down here, totally expected, but you just monitor like how far up that pyramid is thrash going to determine is this a route that we're supposed to going, be going or not in that journey. Um, how did your experience in investment banking translate to starting up a company? It helped me. It helped, it helped me interface with investors a lot better. Um, and so one of the things that I found that uh, um, 
a lot of times uh, first time entrepreneurs have trouble with is be able to translate what they're doing into language that's comprehensible to an investor. And so just having fundamental skills help that as well. And so, and this is just kind of a broad statement, like don't, don't ignore having fundamentals, right? Because the fundamentals are incredibly helpful to be able to take your passion and idea and then put it into something that will allow people to engage with it. Because not everybody is able, like, you're the founder. Like, you're inspired, you're excited, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, you have to be able to surround that with the fundamentals so that the rest of the world can engage with it. Um, and so I found that really helped well with respect to my fundraising abilities uh, when I was raising my various rounds. So, um, you know, everybody talks about raising money, nobody talks about profits, right? And that's a very, very uh, immediate theme today. What people forget, in my opinion, that Google was profitable almost right off the bat, like very, very soon. So, what is your stake on, like, first of all, how does your company translate all the subscribers into financial, you know, book of business? And then two is, what is your point? You know, what's your advice to the guys? You know, I, I'm on the other side. I'm a bootstrapper. Yeah. Like I, you know, I, I grind and you know, profits is like you know, it's a drip profit driven company. Yeah. I'm just curious. You know, like I always look at guys like you, and I'm like, wow, they raise money. You know, they do things, but like, what's the end goal? <laughs> yeah. So, the, so I think that there, it's good. It's good to make sure that you're exercising prudence in any type of business that you are appropriate, and it needs to be appropriate for the type of business you're in. There's certain businesses that are more capital intensive in the early days. So if you're building rocket ships, or like if you're getting massive eyeballs, and that's in your strategy is to monetize those eyeballs. If you're um, doing biotech, well, like pharma, like those areas are capital intensive, and so you're going to be required to outlay initial cash in the first place. What you, what you see happen in many situations is exu like exuberance. And so with people not being good stewards of capital, and that's where the trouble happens. There is a situation where businesses of certain business models are just more capital intensive. Um, like for me, like I've been able to grow to more prevalent levels than my one of my competitors with a fifth of the capital. And that's just by hiring smarter and being like having a strategy, right? Instead of saying we're gonna just be the coolest. Right? So like there is there is there is a type of um, maturity that I think is is going to is going to be required, especially in these day and age this day and age, where the ability to raise we work money is probably not gonna be like a thing anymore, um, but yeah, I think it's more of it, it, there is there. It, it's more about what are you doing with the money. Like you have to make sure you're able to explain what you're going to do with the money, and then how does that start translating into revenues over time in a way that 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 makes a lot of sense in the profile. Would you think? Would you would you say that having investor money puts just a lot more pressure on you to perform? Yeah. yeah, like what, you said like needing investor money? No, 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 once you've taken that investor money as opposed to self-funding, right? Is there a different level of focus and attention because you have a different level of accountability, not to yourself now, but to all of Yeah, people. absolutely. I mean, for me, I think, and, and that might be my temperament, but um, I think that when you've taken in capital, you have a responsibility to be a good steward of that capital and to make sure that you're deploying that capital in the most effective ways possible. And so, a couple things, like there's entrepreneurs out there that, which I think is the wrong approach, which is just raising money to raise money. If you're raising too much money just to raise money and you don't need it, you're actually not doing well by your previous investors, right? Because now you're unnecessarily diluting your previous investors for no reason, and you're just using that money for no reason that is productive or smart or strategic. So you want to make sure, like capital raising, like financing strategy is a, a, like, 
It's not just product strategy, like financing strategy is one of those things that is a part of it. And it's it's like somebody has to own that. It's like the founder that has to own that as part of the job. So you spend a lot of time doing that. And so it's all about the financing strategy and how that, that translates. I guess just the last piece, you know, I think Gary B talked about it uh, in one of his recent stuff. He said that, you know, we're so focused on raising money, right? And everybody just live by the culture of raising money. That we forget that at the end, we have no equity to sell. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is something to keep in mind. Now, I always wonder like how people look at this. And, uh, yeah. There seems to be like a two camps that split down the middle. And uh, yeah. I don't know. What, what I'll say to you is that there is, there is there's real strategic reasons for taking in money, right? Like, so there's companies that, like if, you, if you're taking in capital, there's strategic capital. So like capital that, if in the business, it might give me a competitive defense, it might help me accelerate growth, connectivity, preparing for an event. Like there's all of these reasons why one might want to take capital, um, even if you have the capital to do it yourself. So you have to make sure that you, you look at diff, like, like do you use your money, or do you take money, and like, at the end of the day, like, how is that money being smarter for you? Because the money's going to be spent. If I could spend a dollar, but a more smart dollar, like, I'd rather spend smart dollars every day. Um, so it's all about like how you think about it, but it's all it goes back into what's the financing strategy, and what, how much capital, what is it used for, what type of capital, like all those things are a part of it, and how do you make those dollars work harder for you? Yeah, so going back on strategy, I'm not sure if you might have answered this question before or addressed it. Now that you've experienced the type of success that you are now with your company, um, you know, you had to build a team and you're a non-technical founder. So um, having that experience and looking at your team, you know, do you, what are some things you, you think um, direct or indirectly attributed to that success if you're a building new company now? What would you look for in your team? Yeah, so that's a good that's a good question. I think one of the things that you, one of the first things you have to remember is there's certain people that you're going to bring in that's going to be good for a certain juncture of the business. So my leadership team two years ago is I don't think there's anyone in my executive team to you that now that was there two years ago, but they're also at the company. Right, so it's the it's the idea of bringing people in for the right job. Sometimes people want to bring in a certain level of executive. They're not right for the stage of the business. They're like they're not right for the brick and grind of a startup, and that creates a, a relationship that's not that great, right? And I've learned learned that through the process. We didn't get we haven't gotten every single one of them right. We've been able to hire well, but there's been situations like oh that wasn't the right fit. So you want to make sure that, like, like what I would be make sure is a creating, like if I was going back and building a team now, it's just like, what is the job that I need them to do and for how long, right? That gets you to the next level. Um, and then you have to continue to think about how does that, the composition of that leadership team continue to grow over time. But one of the things that you have, if you're going to execute that strategy, one of the things that you have to also remember is that you have to create a culture where people are not, are, don't feel entitled to titles and things like that, right? So what we have at Collar from a cultural perspective is that we're more, in fact, we're, we're, we optimize to impact that you're making. And so, like, individually, you're like, you could be an individual contributor or a manager, and that, like, just because you're a manager doesn't mean you're going to have a more successful career here at Holler because you're individual, you're an individual, just because you manage people, right? Being a widget maker and managing widget makers are two different types of career paths. And like, you could exceed in both areas just as well, right? Just because of what you want to do. So you have to make, there's a whole cultural aspect there of how do you build a culture where people are, you have A players who are excited to hire A players, you have people who are not entitled, and so that you could Make, you could hire people that's appropriate for your, the stage of your company and not have thrash or fallout or all those things. Actually, people are excited when they see the company growing and they're adding new levels of 
of maturity and the business is moving and it's an exciting experience, people are like, I get to learn from this person now. Like you create that environment versus creating an environment where, oh my God, like they're layering me or something like that. Um, and that enables you to continue to build a better team over time.